Chapter 10 Jade and Kensington Dusk clears tonight, so late that it's technically morning. The rain is gone. I don't have much time left to convince them to change their minds. I just don't know how to, without revealing my visions to everyone. We should leave. There is no reason we should be staying. Most rested up during the day, the rain has stopped, and the vampires can travel without using up sunblock at night. Then there are always the poltergeists that are ready to attack us at any time. Leaving my spot at the window, I get up and locate the self-proclaimed leaders in the kitchen. Hey. Sorry, excuse me. The rain has stopped and it's getting dark. Should we start getting ready to go? I ask delicately. Nah, we're gonna stay here another day, maybe more. Jess answers for everyone. It makes it harder to convince them to leave if they've already made a decision. I should have tried talking to them earlier today. Oh. I was just thinking that we're really close to the border, and we should go into the interior of the province before Darius decides to risk a plea of ignorance of where the border actually is. I explain my thinking while I leave out the paranormal activity that is sure to meet us while we're here. It's urgent we leave. Chill girl. Relax. Darius isn't going to get us here. We're tired. It's been a few rough days. So calm down before you get hysterical and have a panic attack. Go to sleep. You humans always feel better once you wake up. Okay? Bye. She waves me off. I walk away as my brain can't think of anything more to say than a simple, wow. There is so much wrong with what she said and how she said it, that my brain can't comprehend a reasonable response. Ignoring that Darius is likely ignorant of where the border is, she attacked me unprovoked as a human. Like my humanity discredits my point of view and opinions, everything that I have to say. How rude. I hope the twins haunt you first. I take back the mean thought. I probably took what she said the wrong way and jumped to conclusions. She might have been teasing me as a person and my personality. Though, I don't know which would be a harder pill to swallow. Relaxing does seem nice, but I want to avoid a repeat of my vision so I'll avoid the bedroom and reading. I go to the window seat and lay down. Within an hour, I know sleep will elude me tonight. The deep pit of anxiety will keep me up. Sleep just isn't going to happen at all tonight. I don't want to just lie here for hours until I possibly fall asleep, or until the twins start their party. Momentarily, I think it would be better if I could run some energy or something off, but it wouldn't help anyways. I think it's my mind that will keep me up tonight, and the likely impending doom. We haven't been here a long time, but this house has already taken its toll on me. I can feel the start of a migraine at the start of my eyebrow. As a second thought, relaxing doesn't seem to be in my future. I can't just let everyone be killed by the twins, not when I might be able to help it. I should have researched ghosts and poltergeists in depth a long time ago. With the many supernatural being species around, I had taken them to be a priority when it had come to my research. My vision is my only clue. I was reading a book, and the twins wanted to play tag. We ran to the basement, where there was a room they said I wasn't allowed to go into, rather they weren't allowed into. What is in that room? A little exploring is in order. Going into my bag, I take out my flashlight. There are no lights but mine as I creep down the stairs. If anyone went down here, there is no sign of them. I get to the bottom and choose the door closest to me. Grasping the doorknob proves electrifying in a spiritual sense. The air around me turns colder as I enter the room. It's a sewing room. Sweeping the light around, I don't discover anything nefarious. Closing the door behind me is a natural movement. Three sewing mannequins rest lined up against the one wall. Pictures of the people they represented are pinned to the necks, Abby, Abe, and the husband. Complete outfits adorn all of them, but only the purple princess dress for Abby looks homemade. A shiver runs through my soul. Something isn't right. The room is in an organized chaos that comes from being in the midst of a project. Stencils and flower-patterned cloth lay on the table with a marker and scissors. A pumpkin pincushion holds unused pins. Fabric rolls or many colors and patterns lay on the floor or against the walls in piles. The circle of light brightens the room. I set the light down on the table. I can't help but to think that the placement of the table is odd. People normally want to maximize their space by putting a desk against the wall 
but this table is on an angle slightly off from the middle of the mostly square room. On the left side of the table, the one corner nearly hits a wall that juts out a few feet in. A window lets in a little moonlight and peers out. The backyard lights up from the large moon. The exact view one would have standing up from the chair in front of the sewing machine is of the swing set. Likely the reason for the weird table placement, a mom's way of keeping an eye on her playing children. The seats of the swings are not empty however, and I have to do a double take, too small to be children, and too big to be a trick of the eye. What are those? One sweeping glance around the sewing room, and I don't see anything out of the ordinary. Perhaps this was just a room the children were constantly told to stay out of, and that has carried over to their death. I head out of the room and upstairs to check out the swing set, as my mind is in a flurry with curiosity. Halfway up the staircase, I remember the flashlight I left on the table. I'll have to go back and grab that in a bit. There is the rest of the dream to consider. I went upstairs to chaos. A guy was crushed up against the ceiling, I know him now as Jeff. I had screamed for Lucas and Callie. Then I ran outside. Lucas and Callie were supposed to be alive. What happened? What changed? I didn't change anything. I don't think I changed anything that would have mattered. It could be the small things, subconscious changes in my behavior due to a vision. But then again, maybe I did. I obviously did something to make it change. Maybe Lucas and Callie were supposed to go to the farm with us. That would have meant they wouldn't have been killed when Darius attacked Banff. What changed? Why didn't they come? Dominique handled asking them to return. I didn't do anything directly to change anything there. Lucas was with Brad and Callie said no. Lucas was with Brad because they had become closer, after I spoke with Lucas about my worries with Brad, because of a vision I had. I may not have spoken to him about Brad, had I not had the vision. I might have previously had my worries, but didn't voice them. Check 1. Callie, I started drawing away from her once I had that vision of her aggressively asking me about visions of her. She threatened to out me if I didn't tell her. Called me selfish, among other names, for deciding to keep my visions to myself. The dream scared me and changed my feelings about her. My pulling away likely affected our friendship. She might have originally come along because of our friendship. Or maybe I asked instead of Dominique. Check 2. I'm the reason they're dead. I change things and they're dead because of it. Their deaths changed the future of the vision I had of this house and the twins in a small way, possibly a huge way. I yelled for Lucas and Callie on the way out. I had been thinking of going back inside for them. That's no longer an issue. What is an issue are the other people I now wish to keep from a horrible fate. And an impossible to answer question about why I hadn't worried about them in the vision. Maybe they weren't there, or I didn't have a good friendship with them. Walking out the back door, I shake my head to rid myself of the line of thought. There is no use dwelling on it right now. As I step outside, I suddenly I feel better. Like a weight lifted off my chest. The air is much better out here. It's only now that I leave there, that I realize I was slowly suffocating. My lungs take in the much-needed air. It's peaceful out here. Not a sound out of place, silence to help me think and clear my mind. The swings draw me closer. I stop a respectable distance away, hoping my assumptions are wrong, knowing they are not. Each seat carries a beloved toy of each of the twins. A soaked plush princess doll sits on the left and a weathered car on the right. Underneath the swings are rough ovals of equal size, child-sized. The ground has been disturbed and roughly filled back in. Grass hasn't had time to fill in the space. The tokens from each child acts in place of a tombstone. I look back at the house. Something nefarious happened here. People don't just normally bury their children in the backyard. Looking back at the graves, I see beyond the toys. Another grave lies from pole to pole at the back of the swing set. This one seems older, like the grave has been there longer. The grass had some time to fill in as patches. Three people died, that left one behind. A violent life and death trapped the children's souls in the house. Doomed to echo in the halls. Chilled to the core, I decide to go back inside, but not before I gather the two toys, draining the doll of as much water as I can. The person who left them is no longer in need of them, but maybe the two ghost children would like their toys back. The back door refuses to open. I shake it, turn the knob harder. 
I jump back when a child appears in the window. Abe's coal eyes paper white skin and black hair contrast like a black and white film. His eyes are black and empty, I can't take my eyes away. There is a faint scream from within the house. The walls block most of the noise. Blood spots his white shirt. A line appears, then two, then three. Blood oozes from the stab wounds, then out of his mouth. White teeth spill out red until they themselves are covered. The edges of this mouth move into a smile. I draw up the hand with his toy car in it. Abe, let me in. His smile drops, and he disappears from my sight. Banging on the door fails to bring him back. I try the doorknob again. It still won't open. Hands, then torso, collide into the window. I scream in surprise when Jeff crashes into the door. I get out of the way as he grabs for the doorknob, but the door doesn't open. He panics. Banging on the window. He tries to break the glass with his bare fists, but it doesn't budge. A painted rock on the ground becomes a great projectile to break the glass. Despite throwing it as hard as I can. It doesn't break, not even a crack. The look of desperation and futility he has as he runs away, has me screaming. No. Don't go that way. I know this moment. It's when I was supposed to come up from the basement, to outside. I passed him when he was pulled and crushed into the ceiling. Okay? The door won't open and the glass won't break. Think. No one else got out of the house. Why was I let out of the house? Jeff tried the door before me and he couldn't leave, so why did the door work for me? I try again, but the door still doesn't open. The vision changed. The twins are keeping me out, and everyone else in. Why? Was it by chance? Was I nice to them originally, so they spared me? If they aren't allowed in their mother's sewing room, perhaps that window will be free for the breaking. Picking the rock up from its fallen place, I run to the window facing the swing set. The flashlight I left inside helps greatly in choosing the right one. I peer inside. A face gazes back at me from inside. I drop the rock in surprise. Inside, hidden from my view inside, is the mother propped against the wall. She's sitting. Her head is leaned over to the one side. Forevermore unblinking. Her cheeks are sunken in and bones jut out from her oversized skin. She looks as though she starved to death. If the ghosts have the means to keep everyone inside, maybe they kept her inside as well. Her only sanctuary may have been this room, where she slowly died. Or perhaps there were other reasons she died this way. I can't help to think it was recent. Her body doesn't look decayed from this point of view, and I didn't smell anything rotten inside. Gathering my wits together, I pick up the rock and slam it against the window. I lose my balance when it actually works, I hadn't expected it to. The glass gives away in a stone-shaped hole. My fingers bleed from a graze against the sharp edge. Now that it's broken, I kick the rest in. Brushing the rest of the glass away with my shoe. When it looks safe enough, I sit on the ground and stick my legs through. I toss the children's toys inside. Leaning over, I get my upper body inside the window. I jump and fall to the ground. Throwing the sewing machine to the ground, I drag the table to the window. The flashlight falls on the ground. Once the table is in place, I put it back in place as a beacon of light. Other candles and flashlights around the house can light my way. The body stares at me the whole time. It's unnerving, so I throw a sheet of fabric over her. Other people don't need to see this. Time is of the essence. For all I know, each second wasted is another death. With Dominique my main target, I exit the room. Immediately, I am blasted with a cold chill unlike the one outside. The screams heighten in volume. There were people down here. I open the door to another room. Whatever was happening, it's done here. Bodies splatter the floor. A few are stuck to the walls with kitchen knives. Blood spills onto the floor from fresh kills. A scream from another room commands my attention. There is no time to checklist the deaths. One room over are more screams. Running to the rescue is stopped by a locked door. Bang. 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 Help. A desperate scream cries from inside. Hello? I twist at the doorknob, but it refuses to move. The door is locked. It won't open. Please. Help me. Each word is sobbed in his desperation. Banging on the door is useless, I know. Stand away from the door. I'm going to kick it down. My voice is a whole lot more confident than I am. Grounding myself, I kick at the door. It doesn't budge. Harder and harder, I kick and kick. 
A couple thuds answer my banging from the inside. I call out. Hello? There is no answer. I echo the word again, but to no answer. With no answer, no sign of life from inside, I decide to go elsewhere. I run up the stairs. From here, I can see the bodies in the kitchen. Turning, there are a bunch of people at the door. They bang at the door, trying to get it open. Raylene sits huddled on the ground, covering her eyes. Crystal stands guard to protect her owner. She squawks at me. I swipe her head with my fingers to calm her. I grab Raylene's hands to uncover her eyes, but her eyes are closed too. She jumps, frightened by me. Raylene, you need to come with me. I'll get you out. She opens her eyes. If she sees anything through the tears I would be amazed, but she loops her arms around me. I pull her up. Locating her cousin, I grab onto Alexa and pull her back towards us. Come with me. I've got a way out. Help me get their attention. She goes to Daniel and gets his attention much the same way I got hers. Jaden's got a way out. Before I can get the attention of the others, they hear this and stop trying to break the door down. Grab bags will need the supplies. I order them. I do my part to grab my hiking bag. All the extra weight pulls me down hard. I power through it with only the adrenaline in my veins. We aren't far. I walk as fast as I can, it's all I can manage with my cargo. The second I get inside the sewing room, I drop my bag, and then set Raylene to her feet on the table. I hop up and grasp her in my arms again, hoisting her up and through the window. At least this works. She crawls out and pokes her head back through. Alexa, don't leave me. She cries. I'm coming right now, sweetie. Alexa calmly answers back. She puts Crystal down on the table and crawls up to help bolster her words. Raylene, you need to move back so others can get through. I tell her. I jump down from the table. Out of the bunch of people that had tried following me down, only four have made it, Alexa and Daniel and Miles and Kelly. I think three are missing. I pick up the forgotten toys from the ground. As I try to get by Miles, he grabs my arm. Where are you going? To go get more people. I try to yank my arm away from him but his grip is too strong. Let go. I'm not letting you go back there. Did you see what happened to the others? He insists. No, but you need to let me go. I have people to find. You have all your people here. So you need to get out with them. I explain to him. I don't have time for this. Miles? Alexa pleads. He lets me go. I know this is stupid to run back in. I wouldn't do it under normal circumstances. But, I need to get as many people out as possible. Or rather get those out who deserve to survive. Outside the room, I trip over a body, but manage to stay on my feet with the help of the railing. Brandon's neck is broken and at a weird angle. Nothing I can do there. Up the stairs. Against the wall, outside the kitchen, are the other missing two. Jess hangs by a knife through the chest. A vampire killed through the gaping holes in her chest. The other, Armin, bleeds green from the chest in his position on the floor. Both have been stabbed in the exact places Abe had been, recreating his death. How did Abby die? Did she get pushed down the stairs? People, the last I knew, were spilt mostly between the kitchen, living room, and the bedrooms. I didn't pay attention to who went where. Closest to me from here is the living room. I hear some banging coming from that direction. Leah holds a chair at her side. Swinging it, then letting go. The chair hits the window and bounces off. It clutters to the floor below the window. Leah. I draw her attention. Downstairs to the right. A sewing room. You can get out a window there. Great. Why aren't you there? Her question has me feeling like I'm in trouble. I'm getting people out. I weakly defend. Great me too. I open my mouth to tell her to just get out, but she interrupts me. I told you I'd be your bodyguard. I'm not leaving without you. Fine. I say. There's no time to argue. The vast room is empty except for one more body on the ground, Abby. Upstairs. I don't wait for her. If it was a matter of speed, she would beat me in a second. Leah trails right behind me. Six rooms to look inside. Leah opens the one almost straight ahead. It's a linen closet. Leah closes the door. Across from it, she opens up to an empty bathroom. Leah practically runs me over to open a room at the left end of the hall. 
Abby sits on someone's chest with a pillow over their face. The struggling body tries to buck the little girl off, to no avail. I recognize Dominique's clothes. Leah rushes over to grab the pillow off of their face. She manages to raise it very little, before the ghost girl's strength overpowers her. A note for later to research whether ghosts are tangible, or there is only a visual manifestation of them. Leah hasn't moved to touch Abby, so maybe she's only a visual representation. Abby, let them go. I'm sorry your mom did those awful things to you and your brother. It wasn't fair. I say firmly. Walking closer to the twisted girl. Look. I have your doll. I brought your doll back for you. Do you want to play with her? Is she your favorite? Abby's complexion returns to that of a living, breathing child. Her face sad and ashamed as she looks down at the pillow she's holding. Disappearing from on top, she appears in front of me. I hold out the doll to give it to her. Pulling it in, she cradles the doll like a baby and then fades to nothing. Dominique sits up in the bed. Both she and Leah stare at me. What did you just do? She asks between gasps of air. Hopefully gave her a little peace so she could move on. We have to go now. It's a long story and I'll explain later. Without waiting for them, as I know they move faster chasing after me, I move on to the next room. Someone lies still in Abe's bed. Abby must have gone there first. Dominique collides with my shoulder in her bid to get by me. Sean. Sean. The body comes to life. Sean springs up in a fright. What? He panics. Oh God. Dominique hugs Sean in a tight grasp. I thought you were dead. People are dying. We need to leave before we're next. Now. Leah's irritated voice shouts from behind me. I watch as she uses her speed to search the other two rooms and any occupants that had been inside. She comes back with a shake of her head and then starts for downstairs. Looking behind me, I see Sean and Dominique out of bed. They'll be right after me so I follow Leah down the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, Leah's body is thrown against the same wall Jess still stands stuck against by only a knife blade. The blade pulls out of Jess' body and dives into Leah's chest. Abe stop this. The little boy appears. His back is to me and his hand is on the blade handle. He lets go of the knife to spin and look at me. I walk calmly to the bottom of the stairs and hold out his car. Run. Leah sputters up some blood. My body picks up and slams into the wall beside her. The air rushes out of my lungs faster than I can pull it in. I drop the car from the impact. My chest refuses to move. I gape and cough, and then finally a little air returns. Pressure on it feels like something big is pressing against it. My arms and legs are free to move. But kicking and flailing won't help me. The pieces fit in my head for what happened to Abe. What they are doing echoes their deaths. Abby, suffocated as her mother held a pillow over her face. Abe held against the wall as his mother stabbed him to death. Abe please don't do this. No one else has to die. I brought your car back. I'm sorry for what your mom did to you. It had to have been horrifying. You didn't deserve it. Neither did your sister. Just please take your car and move on. She's no longer trapped and you don't have to be either. Abe bends down to pick up the car from where I dropped it. He closes the engine compartment which had opened when it landed. Please let us go. He blinks. The white returned to his reddened eyes and his complexion normalizes. He reaches his hand out towards me, then disappears. With him, the pressure on my chest leaves too. I turn to Leah and examine the knife wound. Should we leave it in there? We're not leaving it in there. She insists. Well, I don't know. Are you going to bleed to death before we can get out outside? You aren't supposed to take out stabbed in items. Leah, determined to get the knife out of her chest, grabs the handle herself. Stop. You might hurt yourself more by taking it out at a different angle. I'll take it out. She lets go so I can replace her hand with mine. My other hand uses her shoulder as leverage as I yank the blade from her. Blood pours out of the wound. It's in the wrong place to hit her heart, but there are so many other things inside a chest that could cause so much bleeding. Dropping the dirty blade to the ground with a clang. Without a word, I hold my arm to her mouth to drink. She takes the blood, knowing pulling the blade out her was a mistake. Her paled complexion a result of blood loss is a clear sign to me. I know the blood with hasten her healing, but I don't know how much it will help. 
Was the first stab a killing blow? Will the vampirism heal in time? Grasping a chunk of her shirt, I put pressure against the wound. Sean pulls my hand out of the way. His hand touches her wound. When he pulls away the hole is the same, but the blood flow lessens significantly. The door still won't open. Dominique informs us. Is it unlocked? Leah asks with a smug grin. Of course. I check that. Dominique's eyes light with the offense she takes from the question. The dad. I think quietly out loud. Excuse me. Leah asks as to have me both clarify and to repeat what I had said. There are three graves outside. Mom's dead in the sewing room. The pressure, it was too big to be a kid. And you didn't think this was important. Leah grabs my hand to drag me down the stairs. I said it was a long story. I counter. There wasn't a trinket of the father's. I know if we come across him, I'll be useless in defending us. Something tells me he wouldn't be so easily swayed. My body loses balance. Pushed from the back with a grate enough for to push all my air out, I collide into Leah. Both of us catapult to the ground. My hands do little to break my fall, but Leah gets the brunt of it all. Me landing partially on top of her. Head cracking against something soft on the ground. Abby's doll cushioned my head. Possibly saving me from worse than a kinked neck or small concussion. My body lifts up. The ground leaves me quickly. I stop. Suspended above head height, near the ceiling. A soulful tug of war battles for control of my body as I waver in spot. My scream chokes in my throat and I can't speak. Nearly suffocating from the hold they each have on my body. Dominique grabs at my waist to pull me down. Her grip is strong, but her strength isn't enough to do anything. Room? Now. I breathe out. The room is just feet away from me. They should be safe in there. Trapped in this hold, I count the moments until I die. Sean yanks Dominique hard enough to move her. He pulls her inside the door and puts himself between her and the outside. She struggles against him to break out. Leah stands up off of Sam from where she fell, but she stands and stares at me. Her face is puzzled as she looks around me and tries to figure out a way to get me down. I've already resigned to my death. There isn't a way out of this. Changes in the future, changes I made, have turned to horrible consequences. Palpitations course the blood through my veins as fast as fearing death will allow. My body flies toward the room. A force lifting until I cross the threshold. Sean half catches me. His arms slow me down for the second they hold me. He loses his grip and I land on my side against the ground. Sorry? He says and helps me up. My wrist hurts but nothing feels loose or moves out of the ordinary. Leah, one step from the door, panics as her body is stopped. It shoots up. The moment her head collides with the top, I hear a crunching noise. The body drops to the ground. Dominique tries to go after her, but Sean catches her before she can leave the room. An indent is where her skull caved in, blood pouring out. Vampire or not, without an expert medical team, access to all necessary medical equipment, and a miracle, there is no way she would survive that kind of an injury. The virus will only heal so much, even hyped up on human blood. I watch as the twins appear, holding hands as they face on their father. His black and bruised form morphs into Abby. An exact image of her when her as she looked ghostly. A twisted grin upon her face. Morphing again. He replicates Abe, bleeding holes in his chest. Slowly growing, the father turns back into an image of himself. Disapproval written in his features when they do nothing. His eyes flick to us disappearing, to reappear at the door. He presses on the invisible barrier. When he isn't allowed inside, his temper flares and he beats wildly with his fists. Not knowing if the barrier has a time limit, or only so much energy it can withhold, I take up my bag and go to the table. Waiting to receive more people, hands reach in to grab the bag I'm lifting out. My wrists protest as I prop myself up on them to leave the rectangular hole. Hands come to my arms to help me out and onto my feet. Ushered five feet away, I turn to see Sean coming through. He doesn't allow himself to be carried away. He reaches back into the house to help Dominique out. Once I know she's free, I stop paying attention to the ongoings around me. Taking stock of my injuries passes little time. The gash on my arm will scab over. The blood is thickening and blood flow has subsided. My cut fingers have large scabs over them, with intermittent reopening. Blood has piled and dried many times. 
My wrists move. They hurt to move, but without an x-ray, I can't see the damage. Patting down my neck is painful, not in a broken way, but maybe whiplash. My knees ache, but I don't feel like checking for scratches or bruising beneath my jeans. My right ankle hurts when I roll it. I look up when Dominique yelling catches my attention. The hell do you think you're doing? Michelle might be alive. I have to find her. The women's back is to me, as she tries to plow her way through people to get to the window. You can't go in there. Dominique grabs a hold of her arm and pulls her back from the opening. I need her. Chantelle pleads. She needs you to stay alive. There's no one left alive in there. We checked. Demink shouts at her as Chantelle tries again to move around her. Listen to me. Chantelle stops to address everyone. Plead for support in others. We didn't think that anyone else was coming out, but they did. Maybe? She's dead. Okay? Sucked up to the ceiling. Her neck broke. I'm sorry. Dominique says. We never did see Michelle die. But she might be trying to ease Chantelle's mind. Prevent her from going back in there. I scream at them inside my head, what I wish I could say. Next time I'm insistent at something, you need to listen to me. We could have avoided all of this if you had just listened to me. Counting the people outside, and I know we're down by at least two-thirds the people we came with. A few I can account for, seeing their dead bodies myself. But others I cannot. I think for a moment, that maybe I should go inside again to see if I can collect anyone that might still be alive. The twins might protect me. Then, I think better of it. It's ridiculous to go back inside. I won't survive another trip. Abby was dead in the living room, and two, Jess and Armin in the hall. Jeff died near the back door. Leah died in the basement beside Brandon. Sam was at the bottom of the stairs. I can account for seven of the missing people through the majority of the house. There were a number of bodies in the basement. Leah had checked the two bedrooms and shook her head. Anyone left might have been dead in the two bedrooms, suffocated or whatever before we got there. Or they hid and didn't come out when we were stampeding through the house. Chantel and D'Angelo somehow managed to get out while evading me, while also knowing how to get out. If they were alive, the father would have gone after them next. They'd likely be dead by now. Chantel, D'Angelo, Kelly, Miles, Dominique and Sean stand near the house. Turning, I see Alexa, Daniel, Raylene and Crystal have staked a place over at the swing set. Everyone else is dead or will be immediately. I turn and run into a body. Sorry? I say reflexively. Arms and close around me in a hug. It takes just a moment to realize it's Dominique. You have two minutes before I go back to being pissed off at you. Thank you for saving me. I'm glad you're okay. You are okay, right? Yes. How are you feeling? I return the hug lightly. I expect her to let go but she isn't done yet. I'll have nightmares forever, and I don't think I'll ever be able to use a pillow ever again, but I'll be alright. She says. Abruptly she pulls away from me to hold me at arm's length by the shoulders. What the hell were you thinking? I say the first thing that comes to mind. I thought I had two minutes. Dominique looks at me confused for half a second. This is different from that. You could have gotten killed. If you knew a way out, then you should have gotten yourself out. Her voice is angered for my lack in concern for my own safety. If I did that, I would have been the only one to live. I was already outside when they locked down the house. I tell her. We could have found a way out. She tries to argue but I know that wouldn't be true. Ignoring that she was a minute away from suffocating to death, and Sean was in a dead sleep, a next likely victim. And, no one was even in the sewing room looking for a way out there. I'm going to have to go, with no. No one would have gotten out. I was outside when the ghosts locked down the house. I was exploring the house when I came upon the sewing room and their dead mom. I saw toys on the swing set so I went outside and found three graves. I grabbed the toys and tried to come back inside but I couldn't. Jeff and I tried to get the back door open, tried smashing the window but it didn't work. By luck, I threw a rock at the sewing room window and it broke when nothing else would. What other choice did I have? Yell at people from outside the house? We know how well I yell. Don't do it again. She warns thickly. I imagine a common confusing threat added to the end. If you die, I'll kill you. If she's still concerned over my well-being, 
then maybe there is hope she'll forgive me. Or, we might just continue this confusing love-hate display until one of us dies. Sean. Come here. She orders him. Swiftly he does as told. Can you check her? She says she's not hurt but I know she's lying. I'm fine. Some cuts here and there. I'm a little achy, but nothing to be worried about. I defend myself. You know she won't shut up about it if you don't let me check. Internally, I sigh. Externally, I hold out my hand. Sean takes it and concentrates. A couple minutes pass. Nothing permanent. He finally says. I take my hand back. Immediately noticeable are the lack of aching in my wrists. Did you? Sean. Dominique. Jaden. What's your vote? Miles breaks our interaction with convenient timing for Sean, right when I was about to accuse him of healing some internal wounds. We stare at them confused and wait for one of them to explain. When they don't Dominique asks. For what? Bamf or BC? He responds. Bamf. Dominique immediately votes. BC Sean answers. The two of them exchange a glance. Neither both. I don't know. Not Bamf. I stumble over my words when my mouth won't catch up to my thoughts. BC might be terrible too. That's another two for BC but Banff is still winning. Kelly grins, happy with the way the voting is going. Why don't you want Banff? Dominique asks me. It's not safe. I say quietly. Weary of what I say around Sean and hearing distance of the rest. BC might be terrible too, judging by that vision earlier. Nowhere is going to be safe. She reminds me needlessly. I know that. But Banff seems to be the least safe option right now. BC, doesn't seem like a great idea either. Dominique pauses for a moment, thinking. Well, where would you want to go then? I don't know. But I think there should be another option, maybe. Banff seems like a horrible idea. Darius will be back. And we have what, 10 people now? There's no way we could fight him and his army. What about BC? She asks. I have a bad feeling about BC. And how far are we going to be able to get, without vehicles? The nearest town could be destroyed. It could be weeks before we get somewhere safe, if at all. Okay. So what would you want to do? Where would you want to go? I want an actual place. She sounds a bit ticked off at my roundabout answers. It's a little more complicated than that. Especially without disclosing my visions. James wanted us to fight. He got our group together so we could help fight when the time was right. He ran off so he could gather more troops but hasn't returned. There is strength in numbers, however. So I think we should find more people to live with and to fight with. And that's not going to happen isolated in Banff, if that's even safe. Darius will be back with his army. Okay. So if going back to Banff is stupid, where would you take us? She enunciates each word. Something tells me that she won't take another anywhere else answer, so I think to my visions and a logical step. Red Deer. I have contacts in Red Deer. I would start there. Lots of people I met there, lots of access to more people, and it's a large territory in the relative center of the province. We might have a place to stay once we get there, food to eat too. If we could control all of Red Deer, it would be a huge loss to Darius. Yo. Everyone. We're going to Red Deer. Dominique informs everyone at the top of her normal speaking range. My eyes go wide. She can't just do that, can she? What? No. My words go unnoticed. Sean, Jaden and I are going to Red Deer. Jaden knows people there. Join us or not, we're going. She reiterates her words and adds to them. She's fully sure of herself that we are going to Red Deer, with or without them. Anxiety slams doubt into my decision. I wish she'd just ignore my suggestion. Less pressure. We'll want to top up our gas in Banff. That way we can make it to Red Deer without stopping. Miles says. Do you think it'll be safer in Red Deer? Daniel asks me. They've come closer to discuss this with everyone. Maybe. Safer than Banff for sure. It's not really safe anywhere so I can't guarantee anything. I answer him honestly. I met people while I was there. Ran some deliveries for Jerry, to a bunch of supernaturals. It's civilization, sort of. Safety in numbers. If they survived winter. You're a horrible salesman. Daniel comments. That wouldn't be a surprise. 
I tend to describe salesmen as a personality type. A person who is charismatic, but will say anything to close the deal. Complete truth, stretch details or outrageous lie, they don't care. They tend to be people who promise great things, but ultimately can't deliver. I'm a realist. I like straight facts. It's better than our other options. Dominique adds. I guess we're in. He says. I guess we're going with you. Well, I'm not going to be the only one going to BC, D'Angelo concludes.